Good afternoon, and welcome to the Pervasive Media Studios Online Lunchtime Talk. These are live every Friday at 1pm, beaming out onto your smartphones, laptops, iPads, and living room televisions. My name is Martin O'Leary, and I'm the Pervasive Media Studios Creative Technologist. These talks are our chance to throw open the digital doors of the Pervasive Media Studio, and for you to hear more from the people who are part of our community, or who are working on things that excite us. Especially big welcome to those of you who are new to the studio, for whom this may be the first time you're engaging with us. For all of you newcomers, here's a little bit about what we do. So the Pervasive Media Studio is a diverse and collaborative community exploring creativity and technology, everything from comedy to coding and product development to performance art. We're a partnership between Watershed, the University of the West of England and the University of Bristol. We're a home for early ideas, companies and a meeting place of both the creative and commercial industries. We're a studio space. We offer desk space, meeting rooms, events and opportunities all for free for our residents. And most of all, we're a safe space for artists to take risks in their practice and make time for collaboration. Now, this week's talk is by studio resident Katie Day and her collaborator, the creative technologist John Sear. They'll be talking about what they've learned from reformatting their recent site-specific experience, A Moment of Madness, into a multimodal online show. There'll be a Q&A at the end, with the talk running at roughly 40 minutes. If you want to ask any questions, just pop them into the chat window. I'll pick them out to ask the team. Or, if you like, you can tweet your questions to at PM Studio UK. There'll be a captioned version of this talk available here after the talk is finished. Now, before we start, next week's talk is by the immersive artist and former creative director of MIT's Center for Advanced Virtuality, Francesca Panetta. She'll be talking about deepfake technology, the malleability of history, and about the speech that Richard Nixon had prepared in the event that Apollo 11 went horribly wrong. You can get news on all of our future talks by following us on at PM Studio UK on Twitter, at Pervasive Media Studio on Instagram, or by subscribing to our newsletter on our website. Now, please don't forget to subscribe to this YouTube channel, hit that button, give the video a thumbs up. The more subscribers we get and the more likes we get, the more we can share stories like this. And please do feel free to share this link now on any of your socials. For now though, I'm gonna hand over to Katie and John. and I'm interested in the interdisciplinary collaborations that can inspire this. I also work as a producer and a curator, an intermediary within the field of theatre and technology. And back in 2010, um, I produced Theatre Sandbox for Watershed, uh, which back then was a pioneering development scheme which supported theatre practitioners from across the UK to develop new work with digital technologies. With The Other Way Works, we create playful theatre that immerses our audiences in the story. We reinvent the way people engage with theatre using real world spaces and emerging technologies. And my role, I suppose, when I set out making a new experience, I'm thinking really about our audience and about kind of focusing on the developing or selecting the form that the work will take. And really, really of top importance for me is um, how the form is synchronised with the work's theme or story or content. So I'll just pass you over to John now, he can introduce himself. Hi there, my name's John Sear. I am a real world game designer. Uh, I started life working in AAA game development, so large scale games for console, uh, Xbox, PlayStation, and then mobile games. And for the past decade I've actually left small screens and have worked on these kind of large-scale collaborative games for public spaces which is where Katie and I have kind of collaborated on a bunch of projects over about the last seven years or so. So for the for the last decade I would say I built have built collaborative games for public spaces and there's some examples of these things you can see on screen. Hundreds of players coming into a, a space to play games together. However obviously in the in the last year, things have changed slightly. And these are the kind of things, um, if we just advance the slide, um, that I've actually been making for the past year and 18 months. I'm sure that's been the same for many of you. So I've actually gone back to my roots and have built a bunch of things that are much closer to kind of mobile and web-based um, games, but still using 
the kind of ideas from things like escape games. As you can see on the screen, there's a bunch of different online escape games. Some played over Zoom, some played in web browsers. And actually in the bottom corner, just for good measure, there's actually a real world game there. So that's, that's a game for Tamworth Castle. So I have made one uh, real world thing in the past year, but everything else I think has been online in some way or another. Thanks, John. So to talk now about the, the project that we wanted to speak about today, really, um, this project is called A Moment of Madness. And it's um, a, a story, a theatre show that we made back in 2019 together. Um, it's a spy thriller story game. It's designed to be played by small groups from inside a car in a multi-story car park. It's a kind of classic stakeout mission, like you might get on a cop show, um, you know, people sat in the car for hours with their coffee and donuts. Um, each performance is for uh, six groups to play simultaneously, six groups of two to four people sat in, in cars, mostly. Um, the, the kind of the story is set on the day of the announcement of a major environmental initiative. And it's a story about an up and coming MP who's got a lot of skeletons in his closet, he's a Tory MP, um, that threatened to compromise his career. Um, and the, we invite the audience to kind of weigh up the ethics of the scenario that we present. Um, we ask them if there's any laws being broken, but we also ask them what kind of standards of ethical and moral behaviour do they expect from their politicians these days? And what are they prepared to forgive or ignore for the greater good of the kind of carrot of progressive climate change legislation? Um, and we, we first presented this show, developed and presented this show in 2019 and toured it in the UK. And then uh, the, the version that we kind of want to talk about more today really is this 2021 online interactive version that we've just finished a, a virtual tour of to to Norfolk and Orange Festival and uh, presenting collaboration with Creation Theatre in Oxford. Um, and then can we have the, the video that gives us a bit of uh, feedback from audience members about their experience of the 2019 show? Just to give you. One of the words that I would use is immersive. And there were moments where it was like we got actually a little bit anxious seeing the actors and it was like knowing that they were very close by. Incredible, sneaky fun. New, challenging and different. It's really engaging, but I felt connected to the characters. It was exciting, made me feel quite anxious, um, intriguing. Nerve-wracking. <laughs> Uh, intense and suspicious. Uh, suspicious. I've been suspicious of everyone. <laughs> <laughs> On edge, I think exactly, exactly it. Having the phone calls, having to text, having to keep an eye on everything, like, and the tension that you felt, it felt like a real experience. Putting all the points together at the end to make like the bigger picture was like probably the best part. The payoff was great. You become hypersensitive to absolutely everything. So there was a moment when a car started reversing towards us at great speed uh, on our way back, and and we were absolutely convinced that it was part of the show. But of course, that's just the, the sort of edge that you've been put on. My favourite moment in the show is going to going to search for the dead drop, and then rush back with an envelope full of stuff. Yes. Really cool. I actually think I quite enjoyed when the security guard came over. Potentially in the car. Oh, Jesus Christ. Hello. Hello. We just have a quick chat. Live your childhood um, fantasy of being a spy. You should totally come along. Well, we were saying it's kind of like an escape room. It's that yeah. kind of thing, but it's like way more real. You are literally fully immersed into this like new world and like you're given a character that you just sort of have to go with, otherwise it won't work, so you have to fully commit to it. Definitely recommend. If you've ever wanted to be a spy, if you've ever wanted to feel incredibly sneaky and like peek into other people's lives and it's totally okay because it's a show, then you need to you need to come to an experience it. Ah, fantastic. So hopefully you got a good idea there 
um, for, for what the players do, mainly I would say in Act 2. That's, that's the real takeaway for the players. That's when they're on the stakeout mission. That's when they're spies. And we always hold on to this idea of, uh, of the kind of romantic vision of a spy, you know, the exciting things that spies do, not the kind of boring work. Um, so that, that Act 2 um, in the car park takes about 45 minutes. Um, and the players are in cars that we provide. So there's six cars spread across the multi-story car park. And most of the kind of real kind of gameplay moments are happening then. So they go out and they, they break into a locker. They watch what Michael, the politician, is up to. And all of that is driven um, by a text messaging interface that we'll look at later on. Uh, the players find a mobile phone in the car and they receive messages from Andrea, who's Michael's assistant, and she's working for us. Anyway, so Act 2 um, obviously is the kind of the, the main meat of the experience. But obviously that sits within two other parts. Uh, act one, which is a briefing, you know, the Lily meets you there, the MI5 handler. She tells you the mission that you're going to go on. And then off you go into the car park to perform your mission. And then in act three, you come back and do the debrief. Um, and what's, what's quite interesting there, there for me from the point of view of the, the game designer is really that it's actually six simultaneous games happening at the same time. So it's not six teams going out to do exactly the same mission, each team sees something different. So in the kind of theatrical sense, there are six different scenes of what Michael is up to, all from the same continuing story, but each car sees a different version of that. So when you come back into the debrief, you've seen something different to the other teams. And likewise, on some of the missions where you've collected evidence, you've collected different evidence um, to other teams. So actually that act three is very much a collaborative one. You're sharing what you've found. So that's the kind of, you know, the, the basic Act 1, Act 2, Act 3 to kind of take you through it. That is all kind of sandwiched between these kind of the meet and greet and the press conference. So the meet and greet is before the players even know who they're actually going to be spying on. Uh, Michael Makerson, the, the politician, he's already around in the environment. So the players get to meet him and chat with him. And I'm sure they're, they're familiar with the idea that he's part of the game, but they don't quite know where he fits. So they've had a selfie with him. They've had a bit of a chat with him. They've already made a judgment of what he's like, even before the briefing begins. And then at the end, you also get to see his press conference. So he's there. The reason he's there today is actually to give a press conference um, about a, the, the clean air bill and about a, a collaboration with a, an electric car company. And that press conference at the end is what changes. So in Act 3, you can see that it says that the players get to vote there. So they bring all the information back, they share it between themselves, and then they get to vote on what to do with that information, whether to shut down Michael's career, as it were, or to kind of hide the evidence and bring it forward. So that's, that's where we were. There's lots of things in there that we really liked, and they're, they're the things that we wanted to bring on um, and kind of keep there for the online version. Um, and then uh, COVID happened. <laughs> um, so we were planning to tour the show more. It had been popular and um, we'd kind of got it working the way we liked. And so our intention was to do more touring, but this uh, came along and then obviously we had to try and work out what we were going to do next. So um, we initially went through lots of different options. Um, we explored trying to obtain funding to create a, a kind of um, a more of a modular um, kind of option for, for the show, because when you think about it, it's actually, you know, a drive in show <laughs> without kind of planning it to be that. Um, so one of the options we considered was the audience members driving in their own cars um, and just driving into a car park in an agreed time and place and, and kind of having their own drive-in show. So I, in that situation, I think the whole show would kind of been delivered in the car in their own sort of bubble. Um, it, that's a long time to sit in a car because the show does run about an hour 45. Um, the other options were kind of uh, having still still in cars, but kind of keeping people more distance for the briefing sessions or doing that in a different way. Um, and, and then, of course, there's the kind of the completely remote option of running it from people's own houses, um, sort of facilitated through uh, an online video conferencing kind of facility and, and online tools. Um, and in the end, due to partly due to funding and partly due to, to be honest, the situation we were in at the planning phase is when we were still in lockdown. Um, we went for 
a fully remote option, which was on Zoom. Um, yeah, we chose Zoom, um, and yeah, that that's that's what we decided to try and make. So, so when we started uh, this adaptation from taking it from the real world to the online world, as as Katie's pointed out, there's some, some bits are kind of obvious, right? When when you kind of move from one world into the online world, and something like Zoom was a very very simple decision for us. Obviously, there's the kind of negative connotations that kind of people associate Zoom with work, which is a little bit of an issue to get around. But most people kind of know Zoom and kind of operate it to a kind of basic level at least. So things like moving the the D the brief and the debrief onto Zoom was a kind of no-brainer for us. So that was kind of straightforward. Um, some things kind of work better actually online or make more sense online um, than other things. So actually, if you were really a spy, you know, this stuff would come to you digitally. It probably wouldn't come to you physically on paper. Um, we use uh, things like we use a lot of paper in the show. There's articles and things that, that players find. Um, which they can obviously pick up and handle so they're still kind of physical objects um and that's just a, a consequence right of trying to get your players into your story world as quickly as possible you know it's different if you're using a big brand like if you're a star wars or a disney right you can assume that players already understand your world but when you're coming into it fresh there's obviously a lot of content you need to feed into them quite quickly um, and we use we use kind of news video articles um news video stories that are playing on TVs around the real world. So when you come into the theater space, you'll see that on screens around you. But there's also a lot of documents that you get throughout. So all of those get sent to your phone now. Um, so we've got fake MI5 file stores that kind of send that information out to the players and kind of keep it unique to them. Um, but things like, so the locker puzzle is a kind of classic part from, from Act 2 when you're in the car park. Um, there's a bunch of documents that the players are trying to intercept about Michael's life or connections with his life. And so the players are instructed to kind of leave the car, hack into the locker and find these physical documents. And that that's great. The players never kind of ask any questions about that. But really, it's a bit weird, right? It's a bit weird in this kind of modern day for those those documents to be physical documents that have been printed out, put in an envelope, stored in a locker in a car park. Actually, so that made more sense. To, to the players, I think, and to the story world to put that online. And so we just transferred that from, from lockers to Dropbox we used. And actually, I'll come back to that later on because actually Dropbox is one of the, well, probably one of the worst choices we've made in that respect of all the things that we made. And then lastly, the, the kind of the end show, um, the press conference that you get that the players have voted on, you know, obviously in person, that's still nice. You know, it's still nice to have a live actor in front of you that's kind of having eye contact with you during that phase and you can see the emotion on the face and you've got the connection with them you know it's lovely to have that in real life and actually during that scene the character that Michael's meeting actually makes an appearance as well so that's quite nice you know that he he appears um, during the press conference but it's very easy for us to pre-record that and stream that straight to zoom as if that's just another video so so things like that actually made our life easier in some respects but obviously there's a lot of other stuff that we changed that we were forced to change to kind of keep the immersion around that around our experience thanks john yeah so some of the challenges that were maybe a little bit trickier to to kind of transfer into the online environment um were um the first one really was meeting Michael Makerson. So it's this meet and greet bit that we have at the very start, kind of almost before the show proper starts, really. Um, we meet Michael Makerson MP and, you know, as, as John had kind of said, you know, you get to sort of, he loves to go around and shake their hands and, and get selfies and so on. And kind of, um, he's quite an amiable presence. He's quite, he's quite fun to meet. And so it gives it kind of uh, it gives some the the players the audience a real tangible sense of who he is, and he's quite friendly, so they get quite a nice feel for the man, and that that made quite a big difference. We found when um, we were sort of testing with audiences around sort of their their attachment to 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 the sort of the issues really when it when we hadn't met the person in person. Um, there was this uh, it just it was theoretical it didn't really matter it was harder to kind of think about the impact of your decision making on his life and when you meet the actual person it does kind of it hits home in a different way and I think um, we really felt it was important that 
that they got the chance to kind of somehow face to face meet him before they started digging into his past and uncovering all the information about him just to kind of feel like they knew him and then they'd have to look him in the eye again having made these decisions about his life so um we're just going to show uh martin's going to show a video now um about uh, which just shows you a short clip of um the new kind of meet and greet scene that kind of moves into our, our at one in the online version thanks that is your cover story the citizens online assembly now we all know that you're here for a very different reason and i'll brief you about that shortly but for this first session it is essential that you do not deviate from the cover story especially while mr makerson is with us in the room lives may depend on it so does everyone understand the instruction excellent i'm letting makerson into the room now Minister, hello. Michael, you're on mute. You're on mute, Michael. We, we can't hear you. No, we, we can't hear you. You need to unmute. You need to unmute, Michael. No, not, not your computer, on, on Zoom. On the Zoom screen, you see on the bottom left of the screen, there's an unmute button. Yes, bottom left of the screen, of the, of the screen, yes, where it says can unmute. You, can you hear me now? Yes. Ah, fantastic. Well, it, it, it's it's great to be here. Such a such a shame that I can't be with you in person. But I guess you're all getting used to seeing each other inside uh, inside little boxes on the screen. Well, not, not too many smart bookcases on display. I see, but never never now. Purple. I've not spoken to you yet. Purple Niels. Is that right? Hi. Yes. Yes. That's Another right. Formal uh, person with both your names there. Where are you calling from? Uh, from uh, overseas, actually, the Netherlands. Well, this is this is amazing. So we've got people in Warwick. I, I, I didn't ask where the oranges were from, but we've got Mark in Camden, and, and you're calling from the Netherlands. That's that's, that's right. incredible. I mean, I do think this is a wonderful thing about technology. Um, you know, the, the pandemic has been has been terrible, but there's been some positive things. Rather like Mark was referring to uh, the you know the reduction of car traffic and hearing bird song and then i found with zoom as well you know we can look inside each other's homes i've looked in homes in warwick and camden now i'm peering in one you know inside your home in the netherlands if it pre-pandemic if i was peering into you into your home like this you'd have every right to say to me what are you doing in my garden wouldn't you <laughs> Niels? Yeah, yeah, that's right. yeah, yeah. i'm terribly sorry to interrupt minister but time is ticking away well i was just about going dutch there trying to get some uh, advice but but no of course time Time it, it, it is uh, is is ticking away, and, uh, and I I can't be with you uh, for very long myself. Actually, uh, as Mark referenced, there's a, there's a big announcement coming on later today, and and I've got to do a lot of preparation for that. So I think you can see from that video that um, you can see the the minister Michael Mason. His we 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 got a new scene there that we'd never had before. We got a scene between um, our two characters, really, our two major live characters, um, Lily and Michael Mason, which was a, a bit of a bonus actually for for this version. We didn't have this in the previous version. They never really got to talk, so that was a bit of a win for us, really, and it helped to kind of draw out the characters a little bit more. Um, and sort of understand that they had a backstory. So this backstory had been in our original um, sort of playbook, I guess, for the show, but it had never really come out in the actual presentation of the show that they'd known each other at Oxford, they'd been at Oxford together. Um, and uh, so we got to hear that in the scene together and then he gets to meet the, the audience. Um, we did think of different ways of of kind of facilitating that, whether he could kind of go between different breakout rooms and talk with people. But in the event, because um, we only, we limited the online version to having six uh, teams, six devices, essentially. Um, it really meant that it's, it wasn't unmanageable on the Zoom call to get around uh, six windows, if you like, and talk to those people during that, that scene. Um, and, yeah, because they, they were sort of in groups of two to four in their own windows, it kind of made it a bit more manageable than imagining kind of 20 people in 20 separate windows on a screen. Um, what, one of the other ad advantages of, of this bit was that we kind of, we refocused it even more strongly 
around the kind of the, the green agenda, as Michael calls it. Um, so he's, his, his um, department is energy and clean growth. He's kind of, he's, he's pushing through an emissions bill. This is his whole kind of agenda. Um, and the, the, the kind of audience, the player kind of audience framing wasn't so specifically around this in the original version. In the, in the, in the kind of site-based version, um, our player context was was an AMOM conference. It was kind of a business thought leaders conference. Um, that was their cover story. That's why they were on site at this kind of a theatre or conference location. Um, and they would meet in a conference room and all the signage was AMOM. It was a business thought leaders summit. That was the kind of MI5 cover. But that didn't really seem quite to work on the online version somehow so we kind of developed a different um a different framing uh which was to to suggest that this was a citizens online assembly on climate um based around citizens assemblies and so on um it also kind of allowed us to rationalize why we had this ragtag bunch of people from all over the country some in family groups and so on uh, attending this very important mi5 meeting um so yeah we we, we came up with this the other the benefit of that was that we got to focus more on discussions around a green agenda because that was so explicitly why they were supposed to be there um and so lily kind of briefed them saying you know keep up the cover story of being being at the systems online assembly um and because they got to chat with michael and overhear each other we, we actually got to have some interesting um sort of input from the audience about their thoughts about climate priorities um and so he questions them, you know, what do you want to put at the top of the green agenda? And, and uh, this, this is on the, on the, the uh, slide here is the list of things that they said. So some, some people took it very lightly and some people took it very seriously. Um, it was a real mixture. Some people had obviously thought about it a lot and it was important to them. And yeah, I mean, one of the funnier ones was when they said, get rid of the rich, eat the rich. And then everyone said, eat the rich. It was quite surreal. Um, <laughs> The other people were really on top of it, had this whole debate about 20 minute neighborhoods. We talked about internally displaced people due to climate, you know, but then there was too much about recycling for my liking. But it just shows it, it was interesting to take the temperature of what people said when asked this question. And it kind of helped, I suppose, with 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 foregrounding the fact that the decision you made as part of this was about whether you push through the, the climate legislation or whether you kind of bind the bind the minister because of his um, skeletons really and his corruption um, so that kind of helped with that um, okay I think that's it for that um, do you want to say anything before we play the video John on this um, just that um, this is a bit about act two so this is this is obviously quite a, a key part of the experience right it's definitely the bit that players remember is being in the car park in a car and recreating that online I think was probably our biggest concern at least you know, how do you recreate that immersion? You know, people always talk about that kind of moment of actually walking to the car park and just getting into a car they've never been in before with the kind of new car smell and all the stuff we've hidden in the car for them. It's very difficult to recreate that when people are sitting in their living room at home. Um, so, so yeah, let's play the video and I'll just talk a little bit more about, about this. Um, so uh, we weren't actually forced to stick with car parks you know because obviously we're online now it all made sense in the original version that the meeting happened in the car park and a lot of that was around Katie and I loved this idea that the car was this kind of safe space that you could watch the theatrical experience from and you could get out from as well if you wanted to but you had a safe space where you could talk but generally in in that two that it's designed so that the players feel slightly overwhelmed right so they've got things they're watching out of the window there's you know there's members of the public walking through the car park there's the theatrical elements that we've kind of prepared for them there's the locker they're going to break into so there's that stuff they're watching there's a bunch of documents that we've given them um, that they're kind of reading and trying to get into the story world and look at all the suspects for and on top of that they've got um They've got Andrea sending them text messages kind of constantly telling them what Michael is up to, ask them to do tasks. So they're always kind of a bit overwhelmed. So that that we wanted to carry through into the online version. Uh, we still wanted this idea that players uh, see different things. So as you pro probably noticed already, there were six cameras that players can choose from. Originally, we thought we might let the players kind of jump around and choose cameras as they like, but actually we thought it was closer to the original experience to have the players assigned to a particular camera. 
So when they, there's a little camera hacking puzzle they do, and that only allows them to get into the camera that's been assigned to them. So that we were all kind of happy with. And then we did sort of make a slight alteration, which you can see on the screen at the moment, is that we went from having just a single view uh, of the of the car park to actually a, a main view followed by kind of two smaller views. And actually that echoed the original experience because I, I think earlier on when I mentioned there are these kind of six scenes that happened. So three of those scenes would happen on your level. One was in front of you, in front of your car window somewhere, so you could very clearly see it. But two others were slightly further away. So you'd sort of see one thing really clearly and you'd see two sort of get a sense of them. And I think that's what this, this setup has really helped. There's one screen that we have focus on that we have audio from, and there's two other screens with just little bits and pieces happening that's feeding into this. And so the idea again is obviously when we get back into the, the debrief, we're all sharing all the different things that we've seen and different things that we've heard. I'll pass back to Katie then to talk about the, the filming of this part of the show. Okay, um, so we can stop the video now, I think. Um, Martin. Thank you. Um, so just briefly about filming it. Um, I mean, uh, it was non-trivial to organise this during, um, you know, sort of the tail end of lockdown. Um, uh, restrictions were a bit uncertain and uh, we did have to work within that. Um, but we, we worked with a, a filmmaker and a sound recordist and we we managed to secure the use of a basement level of a car park in Birmingham. A very nice people at like the Arcadian who let us use the car park. Um, and we filmed um, the scene as a 50, a single 50 minute take uh, with three fixed cameras rolling continuously. Uh, sound was mixed from three static mics, one next to each camera, as well as radio mics on, on the speaking characters. Um, so in that picture there, you can see the sort of the three monitors of the live camera feed, and you can see a sound recordist there, his sort of stations. So this is our kind of temporary setup in the corner of the car park. Um, we, the way we filmed it really kind of mirrored how the scene had played out in the site-based version. Um, but for camera, we needed to provide all of the extras ourselves um, to ensure that we really had permissions to use them in, in a live performance playback. Um, that meant that in reality, there is less activity in the car park than you would usually get when we do the show, because we'd often be performing in car parks where they were busy with shoppers arriving, parking, people going to work, people going to see shows, whatever. Um, and they were all unsuspecting extras in our performances, and some of them were more performative than our performers. <laughs> um, so we, we kind of, we lost all of that, so we had to put stuff in ourselves and give them a sort of short time frame. There isn't as, maybe as much activity as would have been more entertaining. Um, but we, we also needed to task our writer, Tim, uh, Tim Wright, with rewriting um, what uh, wh what we can read, what the audience can read from the scene. This scene is supposed to be quite an intimate scene between Megson and the contact that he meets, um, but we had to make it conform with the current COVID-19 guidance, which meant that because they weren't masked, they needed to remain two metres apart. Um, we couldn't afford a 14-day quarantine for, for both of them. We didn't even have the time. So... Um, that meant that we had to rewrite the scene to work two meters apart. Um, so we had to sort of ditch the, the kind of the shove, shoving and a fight or also a hug. And at one point a kiss that had to all go, but instead we, we lent much more heavily on the sound, which was more audible in the online version than in the actual car park where the sound wasn't so key. Um, and also sort of more expansive kind of movements, bits of audible proclamations and so on. And that's how we, we kind of kept the, the sense that you would read the scene as an intimate relationship between people, but without having a physical intimacy. Um, right, I'll pass back to John. Thank you, Katie. So we just wanted to give you a little little demo of, of some of the interactions that happened during Act Two. Um, so what we're about to see is a, a, a player who's who's got the phone in front of them. So they're having a conversation with Andrea. Andrew is Michael's assistant who's kind of working for us and keeping us abreast of what's going on. But actually, this team has been quite distracted by what's been going on on the CCTV footage. So they've forgotten to kind of 
chat to Andrea. So he's kind of bringing his team up to speed. So can we play that video now, Martin? Sudden thought. Now might be a good time to try his home voicemail. Oh, I think I've been meant to be responding to her text. Oops, sorry, Andrea. Um, can you find Sabrina's business card? And who's Sabrina? Oh, his wife. Oh, I'm going to ring her. The number for the makers is in red is residence. So have we missed a few steps? Then? This is the voicemail for Sabi, Mike, Jeff and Juliet. Friends of my brother should know he's no longer contactable via this number. If you're looking for Jeff or Juliet, please try their mobiles. If it's urgent, I can usually be tracked down via the cab office. And if you're looking for Mike, well, good luck. Great. So hopefully you got a kind of a sense of, of what the players were doing there. They were they were responding to some text messages that Andrew had sent and they'd started on a kind of hacking puzzle. So their next job then would have been to work out the passcode to the Makerson's family uh, voicemails and then they could listen to a bunch of more story content and puzzles from there. But I mean, what, what we kind of witnessed there is the fact that players, um, and I'm sure many of you will be familiar with this, they're kind of unpredictable, right? They don't do what they're supposed to do. They don't do what they're told to do. They don't read the instructions you give them, all of those kind of issues. So in the original show, um, like Andrea would message the players and ask them if they're doing something. The players would say they're doing that thing. But obviously they weren't, you know, we would know they weren't doing them. So then um, we'd actually have someone stationed physically in the car park to kind of tell us, you know, what are the pink team up to? What are the green team up to? They say they're doing this. They're not doing this. So, so we had a kind of fallback plan for the, for the live real world show, but we needed to kind of also have that in the, in the online show as well, because again, players don't tell you what they're actually doing. Um, so actually we'll, we'll give you an example in a second of the back end that, that this runs on. But what it basically means is we track everything that the players are doing. So at that point, when you saw the player is typing in a phone number and they're dialing into the, the Makerson's home security, uh, home voicemail system, that pop, pops up on our screen. And it will say the red team have tried to access the voicemail and they've tried password 0000 or something. And that means at our end, when Andrea is sending a message back, she'll send a message back knowing that information. Um, and that's quite useful, particularly some some players choose not to engage with Andrea. Um, let, I think less so in the online show than they did in the real world show for some reason, perhaps due to immersion. But if players are doing things but not telling Andrea, at least Andrea can kind of chip in and kind of move the story forward. So, for instance, then you you heard that the player had a phone number to dial that had popped up on his phone. Normally, they wouldn't get that. Normally, the player would have found that themselves by looking through the documentation. But because they'd taken so long, they hadn't done what we were hoping them to do, Andrea then kind of starts prompting them. So, so we had a combination of like, you know, uh, using the SMS messages, the tracking of all the things the player would were doing. And also on top of that, we used breakout rooms. So Katie was there kind of in the breakout room if necessary. I'd say, quick, jump into the green room because they haven't responded to Andrea for like 10 minutes. Are they sitting on their phone or have they unplugged their phone or whatever? Um, so just having those systems in place to kind of make sure we could continue with the game, even in the worst case, uh, was essential. So I'll just hand back briefly to Katie. Yeah, it was just really a point to say around um, the fact that we really wanted to keep the experience as kind of as, as Martin had described at the outset, really a, mo a multimodal experience. So we didn't what we really didn't want to do, I guess, is to is to make a, a kind of a single kind of web console version of this where, you know, you just logged into a website, everything happened on there, all the messaging was, you know, built in, it was all just kind of on one screen, um, messaging, video, documents, and so on. I mean, in some ways, that would have been easier, but it felt like we would have lost a lot of the kind of the materiality of, of the, um, the real world version. And we really wanted to somehow keep that, even though it was online. Um, and so the, the SMS system was really key to keep that. Um, so it meant that you, you engaged via a Zoom video, but you also engaged through SMS messaging on your own phone. And there was also other websites that you went to. You went to a different website to, to 
visit the, the CCTV footage and then and there's other other places that you kind of looked at documents or found other information. So I think that kind of different uh, using all of these different technologies and so on, um, it kind of at least gave it a slightly more, there was more physical element to it somehow, even though they were all just sort of different technologies. Um, it kind of kept that feel that we really wanted uh, to, to maintain. So, so let me talk a, a little bit just about the, the SMS um, and the voicemail system that kind of runs behind the scenes. This is how Andrea is able to have six simultaneous conversations. So, you know, she's sending a message probably every sort of 90 seconds or so um, to each of the teams. And obviously over the, the course of the 45 minute period of Act 2, that's a lot of messages to kind of handle across the six different teams. Um, and we, we wanted this to feel like a natural conversation. So the players have got an SMS interface, so they're sending text messages. They have complete free text in what they send to Andrea. And so when you get responses from, from Andrea, it should feel like you're talking to a real person. Um, and you are, right? You're, you're talking to Andrea, and Andrea during Act 2 is played by me. So I, I have to play Andrea six times to have six different conversations. And obviously, I'm not that fast at typing. So the conversations that she has with the players... Are, are somewhat controlled. Like I'm, I'm deliberately trying to um, get them to give me certain types of responses, but players don't have to do that. They don't have to follow that process. So if they if they want to push the boundaries of the game, we want them to feel like they can. They can push it whenever wherever, wherever they want. Andrea will respond naturally. So to make a lot of this work, I think the 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 conversation is split into a number of chunks. That's how I kind of think about it, kind of different phases of the game where she has conversations. And at my end, that's almost like a choose your own adventure. I'll ask the players a question. I'm expecting one of like four different responses and those responses are ready to go. I'll click a button or the system will figure it out itself and it will put that into the kind of text box you can see there. Um, and then I can just, if I'm ready to send it, I can send it or the, or the buttons kind of turn green when the system thinks it's ready to send it. Um, and so a lot of the time it's kind of semi-automated, but if players want to engage with Andrea, then I'm all for it. You know, I, I want them to push the boundaries. I want to have a chat with them. You know, some of them get, you know, they don't want to tell Andrea stuff. They don't trust her. Others, you know, are like asking her out on a date or trying to get extra information from her. So, so it's nice to be able to, to like respond to that. Let's, um, can we play the video, Martin? I'll just talk over this a little bit, just so you can see it in action. Um, so you can Apologies see this. for the terrible video in quality from me. <laughs> so, so there you go. You can see a message has arrived. So the screen has flashed up on the yellow one. So that kind of reminds me that something's happening. I'm then choosing from a bank of a bank of responses. That's pretty straightforward. I'm getting that one ready to go. I'm not sending it immediately because obviously there's. It would be a bit weird for the player to get a big long text response straight away. There you go. I look kind of stressed there. This is this is the end of the game. So um, so pr probably there's there's a lot happening at the moment. There's six. Oh, actually, there's only four teams here. So the four teams are all do doing different things. They're distracted by what's happening on the CCTV cameras. They're trying to hack into the lockers. So you can see all that kind of happening. I'm adding a bit of free text in there, um, to kind of get involved with the players and that text you can spot in blue that pops up all over the place that's extra information that we can see that what the players are up to so when they access a dropbox we see that when they play a video we see that you know when they go onto the mi5 documents we see that so that gives andrea additional information to kind of work from amazing thanks john <laughs> um so that's that's kind of the end of where we've got to with our talk. Um, I, yeah, we, I guess I hope we've explained to you a little bit about how we've taken a show that was built for the real world, we've adapted it to online, how we've done that, um, and how we've kind of tried to keep the, the, the feeling and the themes and the kind of overall kind of gameplay feel of, of the original version and kind of port that into an online version that's suitable for a COVID era. Um, We've got other things that we think about how we might go on with it and ways that it might change possibly uh, in the future. But yeah, thanks very much uh, for listening. That's the end of the talk for now. And now we'd love to hear any questions. Great. Well, thank you both very much. That was that was great. Um, as you say, please all do get your questions in. Type them in the box over there. Uh, for now, though, I'm going to kick things off. Um, you talked a lot about like the differences in the preparation and the systems you use. How different did it feel when you actually went to run the thing? Like, you know, nothing survives contact with an audience. 
I, c- I can do a bit of bit from kind of I think probably the Andrea position. So so some of the things when when the show's live, what we actually do is we the the game system that you saw on the screen there, uh, and what the players are doing actually queues up automatically the actors so we use um slack so we give everyone all the actors and everyone backstage gets a phone that runs slack on it and what we do is we send messages constantly about you know what's going on the players are leaving the car park now or they're getting into a car or they've solved this puzzle and actually what was what was quite nice it meant that if if the players were really struggling in act two we could extend act two and we could delay the point at which we queued the actors to do the the big scenes towards the end of act two um, Obviously, that wasn't a possibility in the online show because the whole of Act 2 has been pre-recorded. Um, so that, that added an extra challenge for Andrea, I think, is that there were, there were points in the past where, OK, people are really struggling now. Let's just hold back the actors for a second or the actors will wait for the automatic queue. So that's fine. Whereas now... I sort of know I really want the players to solve this because otherwise Michael is going to appear and do loads of exciting stuff on the screen and that's going to distract them from solving the puzzle and that's going to kind of slow the game down some more. So, so, so that was a kind of a thing that I think we s- suspected would happen, but obviously it's only a problem when you see it in person. I, I mean, the other one for me, I think, is immersion. Sorry, I think I, just to mention is that you know, go into a car park, get into a car, players are completely immersed and on board with that. They're in a different world. They're spies straight away. Um, when they're still sitting in their living room, you know, they're trying to get Zoom work and they're not sure what phone they're supposed to be using. You know, they're busy eating their dinner, which was actually, that was quite a common thing that people have a nice big meze and a glass of wine all in front of them. Not, you know, it's not quite so James Bond. Meanwhile, their cat, <laughs> is, their cat is standing on their keyboard and their toddler's running through, you know. So the immersion of, of Act 2 on Zoom perhaps wasn't quite as, as immersed as we hoped it would be. Yeah, and I guess it, for me, like uh, being a kind of a theatre person who loves to work in site-based work, um, I, I think I only really feel like I'm I'm really working if I'm physically standing somewhere in some uh, inhospitable location trying to run a show. So it was quite odd. So we we actually did run it, it from from Birmingham Open Media actually, where we're both fellows in Birmingham and so we we ran it from a room there together with with a, a, a John myself and a, a technical operator and then one of the one of the actors sort of in that same space uh, so we, we had some sense of doing a show together but it's definitely a little bit more sedentary than what I'm used to. <laughs> I think just picking up on what you said um, I know I've been to uh, a few of these uh, online shows where uh, it's obvious that there's quite different levels of tech literacy in the audience and some people are like really on it and some people, you know, the whole show has to stop while you explain how to put someone on mute. And like, how do you balance, you know, that with the desire to be multimodal and have bits happening on Zoom and bits happening on SMS and bits happening on websites and that sort of... I, I, I yeah, <laughs> it, was, it was definitely a challenge let's put it that way it was really it was a real challenge to bring everyone through i mean in the in the actual the the real world show it's it is also a challenge there sometimes um just because there are sort of puzzle elements and for some people that's something that they're good at and they're used to doing they they've sought out um people who are used to doing escape rooms and so on um but for others it's a bit over their heads so i think part part of our problem which was sort of the same online is that uh, our audience are kind of coming from two places. So some people are people who play escape rooms, who's more kind of an audience that maybe John is used to. And I'm coming from an, an angle of people who want to do theatre. Maybe they want to immerse a theatre, but really they want to kind of do theatre that... Uh, theatre audiences can be quite passive. You know, that's how, how you're trained to be. So we are often in a situation where we've got these two different, very different audiences, and they both respond really, really differently. Um, and online, that was the same. Yes, we definitely had a, a big discrepancy in people's ability to use it. Um, and we'd get to this moment, there was this watershed moment in the show where it said, now, if you just take out your phones and scan this QR code on the screen that the character Lily says, and at that point, we just hold our breath and we wait and see what happens because at that point, you're like, we're all like, well, the pink team's going to struggle, you know, <laughs> and lo and behold, they do. But yeah, I think at that point, 
that's the point at which the people who've come to play an escape room go, great, okay, finally the show's starting, all the kind of acting is, we've done the acting bit, now we can get on with the game. And some people go, what, wait a minute, I thought I was watching a Zoom play, you know, and yeah. So it was a problem, I don't know. So we mostly, we try to help people as much as possible through, like for example, Andrea texting them, or me going to the Zoom meeting rooms sometimes. Uh, we did unfortunately lose a couple of teams who just, you know, had massive internet problems or so on. But yeah, we, we did really try our best to support. Yeah, I, th I think we, we lost a couple, I think, or maybe one team when it's kind of in our heads the, the game is kind of designed where like the main show is on the laptop right that's that's where you're watching all the actors that's where the cctv thing happens and then everyone else in the room has their own phone and they can all do different things right one person is the kind of designated i'm talking to andrea person and then other people have got all the documents up and you can, can kind of share it and we really tried to get that message across but it definitely seemed like it got lost in translation so people would turn up with one phone between four of them um, or they'd try and play the main show on a tablet so they'd be trying to run zoom on the tablet and then the website on the for the cctv on the tablet and that that was really challenging because you're getting the sms messages on on your phone while you're also trying to look at the documents while you're also trying to then phone outwards so trying to get the message across this game is much easier if you all come with a phone i think we just failed to do you know it just didn't like we kept putting reminders but it just never seemed to take quite as well as we wanted it to yeah i i, I... I can relate to that very, very strongly, I think. <laughs> um, I, I wanted to ask about, as well, with that, did the, the groups of people who were working together, do, did they know each other or were they thrown together at random by the ticketing system? The, um, the, the, we, we worked with six teams, if you like, um, and each team was a, a device. So, um, within the team they knew each other and they would be they were supposed to be in the same location sometimes they weren't um and so that was a team of between two and four so that would be a household typically um so they would know each other but then the the show itself runs with up to six of those teams so those people weren't known to each other so you'd be in a zoom call with with potentially five other groups of people who you don't know. So, yeah. So when you're actually playing the kind of uh, doing the text messaging, doing the puzzle solving, that's with the people that you've chosen to play with, if you like. Um, but in the wider thing, then you're kind of having conversations with strangers. And that, that's kind of the interesting bit when you get to have the debates near the end, just before you vote, we give them two minutes to actually talk about what the heck they're going to do. Um, and that's really interesting because then they, they all kind of bring their own sort of moral agendas to the decision making and argue it out between each other. Just, just to add, I think just the, the, the video that we showed of the players on the, on the device, on the phone, talking to Andrea, that was somewhat of an, an anomaly. We didn't generally allow multiple um, groups from different um, connections into one breakout room so you got assigned to a breakout room and that was just one device in the breakout room mm -hmm. and as Katie said the whole team is around there um, and that that decision was mainly because I built several other games like this and the it, it depends on people's obviously as I'm sure you know Martin the kind of the quality of their hardware and the quality of their internet connection but to kind of stream a video down <laughs> into a machine, which is the CCTV footage down into a machine, then to stream that back out to the rest of your team while also doing the, the webcams. Zoom is generally pretty good, but if you've got a weaker setup, that doesn't work very well at all. So because this was the kind of first run, we kind of set a limit. There was a few other limits. There was some limits like around people from different countries we didn't do, although we did run some tests. But the, the limit, the hard limit there is what we tried to say was um, we want everyone to be in one location to get rid of that problem although we did have a great show katie right when someone turned up with she, there was a there was a lady who showed who showed up and she had her the rest of her team on a separate zoom call so she was holding a zoom call up to the screen so that it was being relayed into a separate zoom call eventually we kind of merged them and kind of put them all in but that was katie behind the scenes kind of made that happen <laughs> people don't read the instructions obviously <laughs> No, no I, I was mostly interested whether you had any sort of disruptive audience members or people who were, you know, griefing or 
trolling. I think maybe one. We think we had one who tr who was trying that a bit. I think he went to bed after a certain point. <laughs> I think I think they were quite drunk. They were quite drunk. Yeah, yeah. There was mostly no. I think there was one show when that was they were sort of in the corner of a party, so they'd maybe forgotten they'd booked this thing, remembered. <laughs> And there must have been about 16 different players that kind of joined this Zoom call at one time or another. But there was a kind of main guy who, yeah, eventually gave up and went to bed, I think, or pa passed out. I'm not sure. <laughs> okay, great. And yeah, well, I guess we're starting to run out of time, but I wanted to ask, what's next? What, what, what are your plans? Are you, are you going, going back to the car park or are you going to keep going? With <laughs> It'd be nice to get back into, in, uh, into a real place, but... Um... The, the next project that John and I have just sort of just starting to work on really um, is a, a piece for primary age children, actually, which is unusual for us to do stuff for kids, but it's around um, climate change again, and it's uh, going to be a kind of a narrative, interactive experience for primary age children to play with their grandparents. Um, and it's going to sort of start off the, the kind of entry point is a book or a pair of books um, that, that will kind of interconnect with each other, one for the child, one for the grandparent. And it's going to be around sort of a little bit bringing in the kind of puzzle storing and a, a puzzle solving and narrative, um, but finding ways to kind of empower them really to sort of start new conversations about what's important for them in terms of their futures and what action we need to take to make sure they can, those futures can become a reality for them. John, what about you? Sorry? Well, John's working on that. That's a collaboration. Oh, yeah, same project. Great. Great. All right. Yeah. Well, in that case, I'm going to say thank you very much. It's It's been an absolute pleasure to have you both on, and best of luck with the, the future projects. Thanks, Martin. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Martin. See you later. Uh, before you all go, please remember, next week's talk is by immersive artist and former creative director of MIT's Center for Advanced Virtuality, Francesca Panetta. She'll be talking about deepfake technology, malleability of history, and about the speech that Richard Nixon had prepared in the event that Apollo 11 went horribly wrong. You can get news on all of our future talks by following us on at PM Studio UK on Twitter, or at Pervasive Media Studio on Instagram, or by subscribing to our newsletter on our website. Please don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel. Give the video a thumbs up. The more subscribers we get, the more likes we get, the more we can share stories like this. And please do feel free to share this link now. Captioned version of the video will be available to watch again shortly after we finish up. Thank you all for watching, and we'll see you here again next week. <laughs>